Gabriel uh, uh, gave, a, gave a workshop, uh, what, a couple of days ago? Uh, you gave it yesterday, and uh, you also be uh, uh, you'll be on the uh, the big stage uh, tomorrow, right? Tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow afternoon, and uh, you know it's a very good one too to start off the Saturday uh, at the at the uh, at the speaker workshops, and uh, it is. Uh, give me the actually, I'm not sure. I'm just going to. Uh, Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, and mute the mic. I mean, don't worry about it. This is pretty co common. We're, we're really right on schedule, like on the dot, which is excellent. Uh, story yesterday, I don't know if anyone caught it yesterday. We had a, uh, we had a plenty of AV uh, issues, but one of the more, the worst one was, imagine if you bring in a work laptop from uh, I'm not going to name who the company is. Uh, and imagine that the company laptop you're trying to use for the presentation got everything locked down. All, no devices, like no Ethernet, no USB, and you can't even get your, you can't even get your laptop uh, working on one of these things. So how in the world are you ever going to be able to, I mean, it was like the most, one of the most locked down machines. Like basically, it's almost to a point where it's useless, and we had a 15-minute delay. Nothing could be worse than that. I think, we're, but I think we're ready, but without much ado, it is absolutely my pleasure to introduce you to Gabriel Ryan. How you doing, everyone? <laughs> you guys uh, recovered from last night? No. Not yet, still working on it? No. It's all right. Uh, wait, wait a minute. I have to do some slide shenanigans. This might be the wrong slide deck, but it's okay. I have it the other one, like, right here. Uh-oh. It's okay. Th th this actually isn't the demo gods. It's the slide gods. So, I mean, I mean, if I can just settle for the slide gods, uh, that's, I mean, I can deal with that. But uh, as long as this, does this have, this have everything that we need? Yes, it does. Okay. Next right. year, I think we're going to have a, now you know what this reminds me? I think next year we're going to have bingo cards. Like, you know, if people have AV issues, if speakers have AV issues, you know, say, if someone brings alcohol and say, twist this, we get all set. We go? I, I mean, we could just do like the, uh, the DEF CON AV issues drinking game. Because yeah, I don't think any of us would make it out of this room, so... Uh. <laughs> All right, so uh, disclaimer. Okay, so my name is Gabriel Ryan. Um, I'm a security engineer at Gotham Digital Science. Uh, we're a New York and London-based uh, security consulting company. Uh, just do infrastructure testing, uh, red teaming. Um, I'm not gonna drive this part out too long because time. <laughs> so new stuff in this presentation. Uh, so we're gonna be looking at a couple of new attacks today, uh, which I mean really are just kind of like building off of like the previous you know 15 years of rogue access attacks, and just kind of adding a little bit to the top of that. Um, and, and just doing some new stuff. So we're going to be talking about hostile portal attacks, uh, in which you can actually uh, steal Active Directory credentials without actually being associated with the network, which is pretty cool. And we're going to look at indirect wireless pivots, which is a way of, by it's a way of bypassing uh, port-based access control mechanisms on wireless networks. Uh, but before we talk about any of this stuff, we need to talk about WPA2 EAP. Uh, reason being, it's kind of the background um, info that we need to understand everything that we're going to be doing later in this talk. So um, anybody here familiar with uh, rogue access point attacks? Okay, about 50, 50? Um, so, rogue access point attacks, I mean, they're, they're the bread and butter of modern wireless penetration tests. Uh, you can use it for all kinds of cool stuff, including stealing radius credentials, uh, performing uh, really, really stealthy man in the middle attacks, uh, you know, uh, making like little fake phishing login portal things, et cetera. If you've ever used a pineapple, that's the kind of attack they use. Um, there, there are a lot of different kinds of rogue AP attacks, but I mean, at, at, at the most basic one is the evil twin attack. Uh, so let's say that we are, we have this access point, uh, DEF CON open, and it's operating on channel six, and we have these four clients that are associated with it. Um, so the, let's say that we were to, cr an attacker were to create, can you guys hear? Can you guys hear now? Oh, this is a really directional mic. Okay, so I gotta hold it like this the whole time. Cool, awesome. <laughs> So we're gonna walk around, just kind of like, all right, all right. So uh, I'll just pick up. Okay, so we're, the first thing we're gonna talk about are like rogue access point attacks. Just I'm repeating that section because I wasn't. Yeah. Um, so 
let's say that we had this, uh, this access point here, DEF CON uh, open. It's operating on channel six. And we have these, these four uh, clients associated with it. Um, and you know, let, let's say that an attacker were to create um, an access point that was an exact duplicate of that. So same ESSID, same channel. Um, do you guys know how, uh, show of hands, do you guys know how these clients would be able to distinguish between the two access points? Signal strength. Uh, yeah, so like if the attacker just creates um, uh, another access point that, it, that is these exact same attributes uh, but is able to amplify the, the, the gain on that um, uh, ever so slightly stronger than, than the target access point, all of these clients will actually drop their connections and uh, connect to the, to the attacker. So of course from here uh, you have a bunch of stuff connected to you and you are a router and you can do man in the middle attacks, all this really, really malicious awesome stuff. And these have been around for like a really long time. Um, actually the first uh, documented case that I could find was in 2002. Um, you know, this FAQ on how to make wireless uh, uh, land security uh, more secure and, and that was by CW Klaus. Uh, of course in 2003 we had the classic AS Sleep tool by Josh Wright. Uh, moving forward a bit we have karma attacks which are a more sophisticated attack uh, which we're not actually going to talk about today but worth looking into uh, by Dino Diazovi and Shane McCauley, that was in 2004. Uh, and then of course in 2008 we have, uh, and this is where we actually start building off of uh, Free Radius WPE by Josh Wright and Brad Antonowitz. Very classic tool. And then of course back in uh, De at DEF CON 2022, uh, you know, 2014, this was actually the talk that got me into Wi-Fi, um, we have improved karma attacks uh, by Dom White and Ian DeVillers because, you know, at this point, uh, karma had actually been broken for a while and they managed to fix it. <laughs> and they also did some EAP stuff that we're going to be building off of as well. And then 2017, very recently, we had Lure 10 uh, by the guy who wrote uh, Wi-Fi Fisher. And this was, this is actually a way of like uh, exploiting Wi-Fi sense uh, in Windows 10 to get stuff to connect to you. So uh, as you can see, these attacks have been around for a really, really long time. And they, you know, they, they haven't really found a way of fixing this with open networks. So pretty much the thing that you use to, to prevent uh, these attacks is your WPA. And we're going to look into that um, further today. So traditionally rogue AP attacks have been used to, to fill two basic roles. Uh, you know, man the middle attacks, which, which is stealing creds and also and also uh, gaining access to the wireless network. But in this talk, we're going to look into rogue AP attacks as a means of lateral movement, uh, which is kind of newish, new, yeah. So, I mean, let's talk about evil twin attacks against WPA2 EAP. And to do this, uh, we first actually have to cover EAP. Um, anybody know what EAP is? Or how it works? Okay, so EAP is the, and, and for those of you who do know how this works, yes, I'm going to oversimplify this for like two minutes, but I'm going to actually go into the full definition later, uh, so bear with me. Logically, EAP um, is an authentication process that occurs between the supplicant and the authentication server. What is the supplicant? The supplicant is just a fancy way of talking about your wireless client. And the authentication server is like your radius server running in the back, in the back end. So the first stage of EAP, um, if we're talking about EAP PEEP and EAP TTLS, which is what we're focusing on today, um, the first stage of this is that the client uh, makes an authentication request to the authentication server. And at this point, uh, the, the authentication server responds with an X509 certificate. And the goal of, you know, the, the reason why it responds with this X509 certificate is, the, is the authentication server needs to be able to prove to the client that it is who it says it is, right? Otherwise, you don't know what you're actually connecting to or authenticating with. So at this point, if the client accepts the certificate as valid, which is essentially saying that it trusts the authentication server, the, we've moved from, uh, we were just at the outer, uh, what we call the outer layer of, uh, of uh, EAP authentication to the inner authentication, uh, inner authentication protocol. Uh, and what that is essentially we set up a secure tunnel between the client and the authentication server and uh, all authentication process happens through there. So um, you know, the reason why, by the way, we use a secure tunnel is that without it, the ent this entire authentication process can be sniffed. Uh, remember that, you know, uh, regardless of the fact that this is WPA2 EAP, uh, the, EAP, the EAP is actually what we're using as the authentication mechanism. That means that the WPA, um, the encryption from that doesn't actually kick in until after authentication finishes. So up until th this entire process finishes right here, uh, what we're actually looking at is, is an open access point. So this is, this is all like open. And, and, and without that secure tunnel, you can just sniff the credentials, right? So in fact, legacy implementations of EAP were very susceptible to this. Um, you know, EAP MD5 is a really good example that comes to mind. So I, when I mentioned that there were like two components to the EAP authentication process, um, I, I, I kind of, uh, that, that, was, that was a bit of a simplification. There are actually three, right? There, are the, there is a supplicant in the authentication server, or, or that is the, the, the wireless client and the radius server in the background. But there's this intermediary uh, that has to be between the two of them in order to make this work, and that's the authenticator, aka the access point. So, you know, on, in, the, in the back end, you have an, a, a radius server 
and, and, and at the very you know, front of it, you have the, uh, the supplicant or the, or the wireless client that's trying to authenticate with the radio server, but all this communication has to go through the, through the access point. Um, you know, and in fact, the communication between the supplicant and the access point is going over layer two, and of course, the, uh, the, the access point is communicating with the authentication server uh, using radius, which is higher up on the, on the protocol uh, stack, uh, layer, layer seven. So our complete picture of how EAP looks kind of, EAP works kind of looks more like this, right? So you have the, um, the initial, um, the client is sending the authentication request to the authenticator, and then, you know, once again, you're getting this response, this X509 certificate, and that's coming from the authentication server, but it's being sent to the client by this AP. And at this point, you know, once again, the client uh, has to accept the certificate, and, you know, if, if the client accepts the certificate, the secure tunnel's established, and, you know, the, the actual credentials, you know, we, uh, the EAP challenge and response uh, go through that, that secure tunnel. Um, so remember that this, this authenticator is an open access point. Does anybody see a problem with this yet? Whoops. No one? Okay. So remember that, um, remember that uh, you know, we were talking about earlier how open access points are susceptible to these evil twin attacks. Well, and up until this whole process finishes, this is an open access point. So what an attacker can do is actually, you know, use an evil twin attack to force the client to um, associate with the attacker and begin, begin this authentication process. And then the attacker just runs a rogue radius server in the background and, you know, goes through this entire authentication process. The first thing that happens is the uh, victim ends up sending the auth request to the attacker. The attacker responds with a forged X509 certificate. At this point, the onus is on the user to reject the certificate, you know, barring situations where the, the, the client device is actually misconfigured and just blindly accepts invalid certs, which that actually does happen quite a lot. Um, but leaving aside that scenario, um, it, it, basically the responsibility is completely placed on the user to identify this as, a, as an invalid certificate that they should not accept and to reject it. If that does not happen, um, this, this inner authentication process uh, with the, that goes to the secure tunnel actually happens with the attacker, then the attacker receives both the challenge and response that can be cracked offline to obtain credentials. Um, so, so I mean, I'm going to do two kinds of demos in this. Like, if it's just like a like one background demo, um, I'm not going to bother with the live stuff because why tempt the demo gods? So this is going to be a, a video. I'm just get later on in this uh, presentation, we're going to do more uh, live stuff. But for the sake of time, uh, this is what this attack would look like from the perspective of the attacker. So as you see here, the attacker is uh, creating um, an, um, a forged certificate and just kind of filling in bogus values here. I'm going to kind of skip through this. Bless you. And at this point, the, um, the attacker is actually um, going to start up this uh, rogue access point. And as you can see, at this point, we have this, uh, uh, we have a client, you know, where it says, um, if you see, I don't know if it's, it's probably pretty small from the back. Uh, I apologize for that. But uh, you have a client that's associating with the attacker, and then there you go. You have uh, credentials, or not the credentials, but the challenge and response that can be used to obtain credentials. And then, of course, from there, you can crack this challenge and response using uh, ASLEEP, which, by the way, as we mentioned, was, you know, came out like well over 10 years ago. Um, and, uh, and there you go, you have plain text credentials. So that's pretty cool. Um, you know, about the same time that this, this attack came out, uh, have you guys heard of EAP TLS? Or have you seen that form of EAP or uh, WPA2 EAP where uh, um, you have to put like a cert on every single machine? Have you heard of that? Yeah, so that, was in, that, that um, protocol was actually came out, I believe, in response to these attacks um, around the same time in 2008. Um, and, you know, the idea is that uh, because you're using mutual authentication, using X509 certificates, uh, you know, fr from the, from the get-go, uh, none of this would work, right? Because the, the client would identify, it just, it wouldn't even enter the, the first phase of the, of the authentication. So the strength really lies in these client-side certificates. Um, any network administrators out there? Any, anybody, like, I mean, raise your hand if, 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 you, if you, like, think that, you know, putting a client-side cer certificate on every single device in your network sounds fun. Is this something that you'd like to do? Okay, we have one guy. <laughs> but, I mean, so EAP TLS, although it protects against this, it's wildly unpopular. I mean, it's, it's, it's really arduous. You have to put um, one of these certs on every single device in your network. And not only that, you know, it's, not even, it's possible that you may have devices that aren't even compatible with this. I mean, especially, like, if you work, like, in healthcare or, you know, you know, industrial control systems, stuff like that, they may not even support client-side certs. 
So, I mean, you, you, you run into this classic security versus convenience scenario where you're, 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 you're forced to choose between um, an authentication mechanism with a known weakness or a highly secure um, authentication mechanism that is just really difficult to implement. So, of course, you know, anyone, anyone go to a uh, certain other security conference with lots of vendors and flashing lights earlier? Yeah, so, like, of course this creates a market gap. Uh, you know, someone is going to come in and, and, and try to uh, create a product uh, that can be used to compensate for these security issues while still being easy to use. So, um, and the current trend actually is to focus on breach containment rather than prevention. Uh, so the idea is that, you know, yes, you, you acknowledge the risk associated with um, using um, EAP PEEP or EAP TTLS and that this network, you know, is vulnerable to these attacks, but um, the idea is that, you know, once the attacker gets on your wireless network, you immediately contain them and, and you know, prevent them from accessing anything important. So, what we're going to explore today is whether this actually works. So, um, the, uh, I, I guess the most common way of approaching this scenario is to use a network access control mechanism. Uh, and I'm just going to present you guys this little, this little cartoon before I continue. <laughs> so, um, network access control mechanisms. I mean, this is like one of the most popular ways of containing wireless breaches. And the idea is that, you know, when a new device is added to the network, you immediately, you know, flag it as either authorized or unauthorized. If it's authorized, you let it continue uh, and, and access stuff. And if it's unauthorized, you place it on a quarantine VLAN or, or, or flat out, um, you know, block the port and, and not, and, you know, disconnect it entirely. Um, and, and it's not allowed to do anything. Um, so, I mean, there's two, two ways of doing this. You know, there are two traditional varieties of NAC. Yes, there are ne next generation NACs, and we'll talk about them more later. Uh, but traditionally, we've had two different kinds of network access control me mechanism. We've had agent-based and agentless. So, um, with an agent-based NAC, uh, you actually have a software component that's installed on every single authorized endpoint. You know, this, this agent, um, the job of this agent is to communicate with the brain of the NAC and, and pretty much, you know, I, I allow the brain of the NAC to perform deep interrogations on the endpoint. Um, you know, it, it's really effective, but, you know, once again, you're in a situation where you have to install something on every device on the, on the network. So it's very impractical, kind of like EAP TLS. Um, you also have agentless NACs, which it just uses passive fingerprinting and also does, like, external scans to try to identify what's authorized and what's not. Um, you know, if, as you can imagine, this is pretty easy to, to deploy, but, you know, you can't examine the internals of the devices, so uh, it can be bypassed pretty easily by, by masquerading as, as something valid. So, you know, once again, you run into this recurring dilemma where, you know, you have a, a, a more insecure solution, but th that's pretty practical, uh, but you also have a, a, a very secure solution that's very impractical. So we're kind of, you know, back to square one here. And, of course, this creates yet another market gap, um, you know, where this, there's this high demand for a solution that, you know, offers the deep interrogation capabilities of an agent-based NAC, uh, but is, has the convenience of an agentless NAC. So, you know... This, this, lead, this led to the rise of, of something called uh, the next generation NAC. And there's a, there's a lot of different, um, there's a lot, a lot of different uh, uh, approaches that people have taken. Uh, we're just going to explore one just to kind of, you know, as an example. Um, so there's a particular NAC that I wanted to bring in here to do a demo with. So uh, I, I actually tried to get approved to bring one here. So I put, I put in a ticket to, to, to my company's um, IT department. Um, and of course, these things cost $10,000 $10, a pop. As you can imagine, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that, 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 that didn't go very well. But not only that, you know, our legal department just kind of said, uh, yeah, you, you shouldn't go up, this, keep this vendor neutral. So um, for the sake of keeping this vendor neutral, the, the, the vendor that we're going to talk about uh, is going to be referred to as vendor A. And if you're really curious and want to know, you know, who or what I'm talking about, do some research, you can probably figure it out, but I know nothing. So, you know, vendor A uses, you know, a good example of a next generation NAC um, and an and approach to kind of like, you know, bridge this, uh, you know, gap between agentless and agentless agent-based and agentless solutions um, is vendor A. And vendor A uses uh, WMI to interrogate new devices. Uh, and, and, and this allows it to, you know, to, to perform deep internal checks without using an agent. And to do this, it authenticates over SMB using a, a single administrative service account. And this single administrative service account runs with you know, pretty high privileges. I, I think it actually has, uh, runs as DA, if I remember correctly. And this allows it to perform deep interrogations without the use of a, use of a network. Unfortunately, uh, does anyone see a problem with this? Yeah, you have this single point of failure. You have this device that, you know, can access everything on the network with high privileges and is sending hashes to every, every new endpoint that, that accesses the network. So you have God mode hashes sent to every, any device that gets on the network and you have a single point of failure. So uh, background info, does, does any, raise your hand if you do not know or what an SMB relay attack is. Okay. What, what, what about those of you who do know what an SMB relay attack is? Raise your hand. Oh, there are a lot of undecided people here. Great. Um, it's okay. It's early. Um, 
so and, and you know SMB relays, you know, pretty much they, they take advantage of, of the S, the NTLM um, protocol. Are you guys familiar with NTLM at all? It's a it's a simple challenge response pro, uh, mechanism, very similar to PEEP, which is what we talked about earlier. And the way that this works, um, actually, I need two volunteers. You start with the tattoos. Okay, so you want to authenticate with that guy on the computer, right? Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to send him uh, a plain text string, right? Uh, or uh, saying, I, actually, no, you're going to say, I want to authenticate with you. And you're going to say, okay, uh, that's great, right? Um, here, here's a plain text string. Encrypt it for me using your password hash. Um, and you're going to say, okay, you encrypt it using password hash, send it back to him. And then at that point, uh, you know, he's going to say, he's going to decrypt the encrypted string using your password hash. And if um, the decrypted string matches the original string, um, then, then, then the authentication attempt succeeds, right? Does everyone kind of get how that works? All right, that's NTLM, guys. Um, so <laughs> no need to overcomplicate it. Um, so with an SMB relay attack, okay, now I need three people. Can someone stand right there? Yes, excellent. And, and um, actually, tell you what, can you guys like pass it? I don't know what this is, but I'm going to borrow it. All right, can you head it to that? Yeah. So now you are going to attempt to authenticate with this dude. But the thing is, you think that you think that he is him, right? So you're gonna you're gonna pass your authentication um, attempt to him, right? And you're gonna just pass it directly on to, to this dude. No, you're not gonna keep it. <laughs> and then and then you're gonna pass it back to back to him, right? And that's that's the encrypted string you're passing back. You're going to encrypt or the plain text string. You're going to encrypt it and pass it back to this dude. Yes, exactly. And now now you're going to just you know relay it back to uh, to the, to the server, and you're gonna decrypt it and. Is it, is it good? It's good. Okay, so you're going to pass it to this dude. And, oh, shoot, he's authenticated with him instead of him. And that's an SMB relay attack. And, you know, you can, you can kind of explain this using diagrams too, but, I mean, does everyone get SMB relay now? Okay, good stuff. So, you know, going back to, to you know, these next generation NACs or this particular one, you know, of course, if you, if you have everything authenticating, you know, using NTLM, um, then, and, and you're sending, you know, hashes to every new thing on the network, um, at this point, you have the risk of SMB relay attacks, uh, where you can just, you know, um, authenticate with the network and, uh, and, and, and wait for the hash to be sent to you and then relay them to anything that you want to authenticate with. Um, so that's bad. Uh, but you could also, you know, of course, you could mitigate this. Uh, by enabling a, something called SMB signing, which is where you digitally sign packets to confirm their auth auth authenticity. Um, you know, but, but by default, this is actually disabled uh, um, on, on Windows machines except domain controllers. Uh, and that's because group policy is actually downloaded over SMB. So, you know, and, and the cool thing is, in this case, you don't actually need a man in the middle attack because the NAC appliance is trying to authenticate with you. Of course, you know, if you do turn it on, it'll, it, it, SMB signing on, it will, it will mitigate um, this issue. Uh, but you still have a situation where you have, um, you know, hashes being directly sent to untrusted, un untrusted endpoints. So, um, I, I guess, you know, that, that wasn't just a tangent for a reason. I mean, this tangent actually serves a purpose, and that's to show that, you know, there really is no magic bullet. I mean, here's actually a really solid attempt to, to kind of bridge these gaps between security and convenience, but unfortunately the problem is that security with convenience is often a paradox. And, and you know, that, that goes right back to the issue of EAP TLS, which we're going to look at um, uh, later on. So um, let's talk about client isolation. Are, you, are any of you familiar with it? Have any of you, any of you tried to get on like a, 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 like a hotel network or something recently and tried to ping something and you couldn't? That's because client isolation is enabled. So the way that 802.11 um, is supposed to work is that the AP is supposed to mediate all traffic uh, between you know, the, the, the clients associated with the AP um, and you know, other endpoints on the network. So for example, you have these two clients associated with this access point, and, and in theory, the AP is supposed to mediate all the packets going between the, these devices. So to enable client isolation, um, you, know, you, you basically just prevent, you, if you see a packet that's, that's going from one of these client devices, and, and instead of going upstream, it's going to another uh, device associated with the access point, you just deny it and don't let it, don't let it through, right? And on a wired network, this is, actually, this is actually possible at a physical level. But the problem is that on a wireless network, client isolation is a logical control. It's not a physical control. So you know, th this raises the question, you know, how do you prevent radio transceivers from communicating with one another? And this awesome research, fortunately, researcher, unfortunately he's no longer with us, but this awesome researcher named Cedric Blanchard, in 2005 his answer was, you can't. And you know, he introduced uh, this tool called Wi-Fi Tab. Uh, and this was first released by Cedric Blanchard, uh, as, as we mentioned, in 2005. Um, so once again, quite a long time ago. And it was revived more recently uh, by Oliver Lavery of Gotham Digital Science, way before my time. Um, and you know, the idea here is what, what this does is it reads packets. It has a, you, have, you have two interfaces, uh, a ton tap interface that's attached to a monitor mode interface. And this monitor mode interface just listens for packets coming, um, uh, coming from 
to and from the AP, right? And you know, when, when you see, it, when you see a, a packet being sent from the client to the AP, you inject the response uh, as if it came from the access point. And, and this actually allows you to bypass client is isolation. And you know, of course, there were uh, um, there, there's some later tools that built off of this. Uh, Airton and G it supports WEP, and you know, Tkip Ton and G uh, it, it supports WPA1. Uh, these are both part of the Aircrack suite. If you were here earlier this morning, um, and, and actually, there is one that apparently you you theoretically could use it against WPA2, although I don't believe it. Uh, called Whole 196. Um, you know, it's it's worth mentioning just because it, it's been talked about, but. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, considerably debatable whether it actually works. So, to kind of demonstrate how this how it does its thing, um, let me just check the time really fast. Okay, we're doing decently. We got to hurry. Um, so over here we have, uh, you know, the bottom right we have one uh, terminal, right? And this terminal uh, is 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 the the host operating system. In the, in the top right, we're going to create an access point, uh, and this is going to be the access point that we're going to be, uh, you know, the network that we're going to be going to be attacking. And then on the left here. Uh, we have uh, an, an attacker machine. This is SSH into an attacking machine. So what we're first going to do is we're going to send five ping packets, uh, to, you know, to the to the AP on, on on this target network, and that's happening in the bottom on the bottom right here. And as you see, we we, we sent five ping, ping packets, and we have five responses. So and then why did that do that? Okay, there you go. Okay. So and then on the on the left, we're going to in, in this terminal here. Uh, we're going to run a tool called Wi-Fi Ping, and it's essentially a modified version of Wi-Fi Tab that just sent um, any ICMP uh, request that it, that it sees, it'll send an ICMP response. So it's a it's a pretty good way to do a proof of concept of this. So now you know in the bottom right, now that we're running this this Wi-Fi Ping tool, uh, you'll notice that we we are we're doing the ping again. But this time this time you can see all you know although we sent five ICMP packets, we've received uh, ten, and that's because. Um, and, and you see all these warnings saying they're duplicate ICMP packets, and that's because we're actually sending packets to this device without even being associated to the network. So that just kind of shows you how, you know, Wi-Fi uh, client isolation can be bypassed. So, yeah. Anyways, back to na back to NACs, right? You know, some food for thought. You know, we've been we've been focusing on on, on whether or not you know, uh, you know, NACs in general are effective against you know pr stopping direct uh, direct attacks, right? But I mean, what if we're missing the point and and, and not approaching this, this this the right way at all? The role of a NAC in containing a wireless breach is to prevent an attacker from, from accessing sensitive resources after the breach occurs. And you know, uh, unauthorized endpoints detected, it's either placed in quarantine or the port is blocked. You, it, when this happens on a physical or on a on a on a on a wired network, this is actually a physical restriction. So it's it's pretty solid. Uh, but on a wireless network, this can only be a logical restriction. Um, and, and more on this later. So you know, I think I think to understand the implications of this, it's best to to use an example scenario. You know, we're attacking a wireless network and it's used to access sensitive resources, and we've already breached the perimeter using the attack we, we did in the first part of this uh, first part of this talk. This is us on the left. You know, we're an attacker on this quarantine VLAN, and on the right we have the victim that's on this uh, restricted VLAN. And and we obviously you know we, we don't want to be on this quarantine VLAN. We want to be able to get over to this restricted VLAN and access you know the sensitive resources and stuff. Unfortunately, we've been flagged by this uh, by this network access control mechanism um, as unauthorized. So we, you know we, we're kind of you know we've been jailed. We can't really do much. So the question is, how do we get out? Well, let's talk about some more stuff. Anybody here use Responder before? Okay, cool. So I mean, some of you probably are familiar with LMNR or MBTS poisoning. Uh, once again, quick review. Um, who know, here knows how NetBIOS name resolution works? Okay, a couple people. All right, so um, you know, quick refresher: the way NetBIOS name resolution works, um, you know, there, it basically there's a cycle that goes through. Um, the first thing that happens is that the the Windows host uh, checks the local cache uh, of stuff it's previously uh, uh, sent information to. It, it, it'll also check the LM host file, which it has it's it's a hard coded file of that resolves um, uh, you know host names to IP addresses. If that fails, it'll it'll use uh, a local DNS uh, to attempt to resolve these names. And finally, if the, if, ever, if all those options are exhausted, it will fall back to two protocols that, although under the hood, work a bit differently um, from a higher level logical perspective, uh, and also in terms of the security impl 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 uh, implications associated with them, um, are, 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 are you can be thought of as as, as logically equivalent. And that's LM and R and MBTNS. And uh, these protocols are best, uh, you know, best understood through example. You know, let's say that you have two, uh, you know, NetBIOS machines on, on the network, and, and named Alice and Leroy. Alice wants to set, wants to get a file from Leroy, but Alice does not know Leroy's IP. 
So Alice is first going to exhaust those three options, right? You know, local, um, attempt local resolution, also tr try local DNS. And if that fails, Alice is going to, um, you know, make a broadcast request across the entire subnet using LMNR and MBTNS. So at this point, every computer on Alice's subnet is going to receive this request. And the idea here is that despite all of them receiving it, only, only, um, only Leroy will respond. Uh, does anyone see a problem with this? Yeah, so like it, it's kind of an honor system. It's, it's very similar to ARP, in fact. Um, although it came out like 10 years later, so I don't, I don't get it exactly. Um, but the problem is like if Alice receives two responses, uh, only the first one is considered valid. You know, this creates a race condition uh, where the atta an attacker can just wait on the network for LMNR and MBTNS queries and respond to all of them. At that point, the victim um, will end up sending traffic to the attacker instead, creating a man in the middle. So a quick demo on how that works. Uh, we have the attacker on the right, or on the left, should I say, and a victim on the, on the right. And the attacker is going to run a tool uh, by Lawrence Joffe called uh, Responder that's going to do this. As you can see, we're, we're poisoning uh, LMNR and MVTNS, and we have these rogue uh, servers here that are going to wait for the authentication attempt. And on the right, we're going to attempt to access a non-existent SMB share. And the reason why we're doing a non-existent SMB share is because it's guaranteed, you know, the, the host is going to see that and it's going to, it's guaranteed not to be um, able to be resolved locally or using local DNS. So it's, it's going to be automatic, it, we know that it's going to fall back to LM, LMNR and MBTNS. So we're going to do this. As you can see here, we end up with hashes very quickly. So. Uh, we're about 5% through a little escape attempt from that, from that thing, but I mean, this is... <laughs> All right, the other thing we need to understand in order to figure out, you know, understand how we can get out of this, it's another attack um, that we'll, that we'll briefly call, uh, cover called redirect SMV. So anyone know what redirect, uh, redirect SMV is? All right, it's pretty straightforward, right? You, you, you trick the victim into accessing a URL that takes them to a server, and all this server does is, is redirects them to an SMB share on the attacker's network. Or SMB server. So they get redirected to this SMB server, and, and at this point, IE or whatever it is they're using is forced, into, is forced to do NTLM authentication with the attacker, and you get hashes, as much as we uh, previously saw. Requires a bit of social engineering. Okay, back to wire wireless, and this is where we go into new stuff, which is, which is cool. Um, let's talk about hostile portal attacks. Um, hostile portal attacks are a way of stealing Active Directory credentials uh, without direct network access. So um, how, many, how many of you guys, um, seen something like this recently. Yeah, so that's a captive portal. And the way a captive portal uh, works is that all DNS queries are resolved to the, to the captive portal. This is the, you know, the DNS server is pushed out through a DHCP option, and then that's, that's, uh, the DNS server then sends everything uh, to the captive portal. Of course, you can also redirect DNS traffic uh, in case they're, they're, they're manually specifying um, a DNS server. And of course, you can, if, if that fails, if they're trying to access stuff directly using IP address, you can actually redirect um, HTTP traffic to the portal as well. So um, a hostile portal attack is very, very similar to this. Um, it's based on you know, the redirect to SMB attack. Uh, but you know, instead of being forced to, the victim being forced to, uh, to visit this, uh, this, this captive portal login page, uh, they're actually just forced to, to, to access an SMB share. So you redirect to an SMB share instead of a login page. Very simple, um, but uh, very effective. You force the, um, if you look at this, uh, oh, in the background, by the way, you poison all LMNR and MBTNS in case they're just completely idle. But you know, this is how it works. You have an attacker, and you have the victim on the target network. Use a rogue access point attack to force the victim to associate with you, and then you immediately redirect them to this SMB share uh, using the same technique we use for a captive portal. And this results in lots and lots of hashes. And you know, we're first going to show you a demo. Um, and I actually have uh, looks like 15 minutes left, so I'm just going to fly through this video because. Um, so here on the on the top right. Uh, we have a, uh, you know, we're going to create our, we're going to create our legitimate access point. This is a, this is our target network. Then we're going to connect to it from our victim machine that's on the on the um, on the bottom right. And you know, as I said, we're going to do this with an open network first because there are a couple more steps that we have to do in order to get this to work with with EAP uh, or WPA2 EAP, should I say? Um, but yeah, we'll get to that in a second. So, and I just got prompted to update when I when I recorded this, but. So we're first going to associate it with this target network at some point here. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so our client is, device is now connected with the network. And then on the left here, um, uh, we're going to launch the uh, rogue access point attack. So the first thing that's going to happen is um, we're going to start a rogue access point. 
and then we're going to send some DLF packets to kind of force it to roam from, from the, the target BSSID to our rogue access point. So as you, as you can see here, we have an association. And then, um, interestingly enough, as soon as the victim opens uh, IE, which we're going to do in a second, uh, we have hashes. So if they're you know, previously doing anything that requires HTTP, um, it'll just send hashes to, to the attacker. At this point, the attacker, and actually, um, thing to note, look how many times it's actually sending us authentication, and that, um, or hashes, should I say. And, and that's because every time we type in a new character into the address bar there, um, that's actually sending out an HTTP request to Bing search. Uh, and, and that, you know, of course, we're just redirecting that. So every time you type in a character, uh, we're trying to authenticate with the attacker. So, all right. So, you know, if, if we're doing this with WPA EAP networks, it, it's going to require a little more work. And this is because, you know, in most cases, uh, we're going to be talking about EAP TTLS and EAP PEEP. Uh, both use MS Chat, Chat V2 uh, as, as the inner authentication method. Although it's, it's you can you can kind of uh, you can you, you can often get uh, EAP you know clients that are connected to an EAP TTLS network to to agree to something a, a little less uh, a little less secure than that. But especially with EAP PEEP, you're stuck with MS Chat V2. Um, so what this means is that um, with MS Chat V2, uh, it's actually a, a mutual authentication protocol. So this means that the server the radius server must prove knowledge of the supplicant's password in order for the uh, inner authentication attempt to succeed. So this means that although the, you, know, you can uh, con force a device to connect to you and, and do that authentication process and give you an EAP challenge and response that you can crack offline, um, you know, there's still that very, very, very final step, that final stage of the, of the inner authentication process in which the client will actually not be able to fully associate with the attacker because it's going to, you know, the radius server is going to fail that final stage of the authentication process. Um, so the solution to this is, is that it, well, we have a couple of them, depending on the strength of the, uh, of the radius passwords in use. We can use something that, um, this came out in the same talk I mentioned earlier in, in DEF CON 22 um, by uh, the, the guys from SensePost, Don White and Ian DeVilliers. Uh, they, they came up with a method called autocrack and add where you basically, uh, you, you perform that first attack that we saw in the very beginning where we capture the, the challenge and response, but then we immediately append it to uh, the, the, the kind of the database file that our, our radius server uh, reads from. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but if, if, the, if the creds are stronger, you actually have to, you know, crack them offline and finish the attack later. And, and that's actually pretty feasible too, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So, uh, the, the, talking about the first method. Uh, the way the, the auto crack and add thing works is that you, you take the challenge, um, the, you receive the challenge response, and that's the thing that you're cracking to, to obtain uh, creds. At this point, what is supposed to happen at the very end of the, um, the MS Chat V2 auth authentication protocol is that the radius server, or host APD in this case, um, loads the password from a file called the EAP user file. It's basically a very simple database that's implemented using a text file. And it has information like the username, uh, password, and then information about how that user is allowed to associate with the network. So it loads this password, and it uses that to forge the, um, the authentication response, which is sent with the success message to the victim. And, you know, of course, you know, if, if, the, uh, if it was able to load that file uh, and, and it's able to provide a, a valid authentication response, the association attempt succeeds, or authentication attempt succeeds, should I say. So um, with the auto crack and add technique that we talked about, um, what's going to happen is that the, uh, the, you know, the attacker, instead of immediately loading that password from the EAP user file, uh, the, the, password, uh, the password actually, um, the, the attacker is going to take that challenge and response and then immediately send them off to a cracking rig. And the idea is that, especially if you're using a remote cracking rig like, you know, CloudCrack or something like that, that, that you know, that has, you know, a significant amount of horsepower behind it, um, you should be able to, or at least within a couple of attempts, um, you know, crack that in time to then add it to the, to the end of your EAP user file, uh, just kind of append it to the end of the file, and then send the, uh, the, the, you know, use that to create the authentication response. So it's, it's almost like this race condition. And, 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 and if that doesn't work the first time, you just try it immediately again. This time you already have it. And, and as the client tries to reassociate with you, um, you pull off the attack. So um, the second, you know, of course that works with, with, with weaker um, credentials, uh, but our second option is, you know, the offline crack. And, you know, you may be thinking, yeah, this, 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 this is going to take a little more time. Uh, but remember that, you know, it, it actually isn't as bad as you think. You know, rather than the attack taking, you know, minutes to an hour, it's not going to take a few hours to maybe a week. And of course, you know, it, it, you know, uh, real attackers aren't time boxed. So even if you have a really, really long radius um, password, you still have your APTs out there, like the guy on the right. But um, so, uh, and one, one more thing to consider is the fact that you already have the credentials if you're on the network in the first place, which is how we're trying to get out of the situation. But yeah, here, here we are once again. Uh, this, we're going to use the auto crack and add technique to, uh, uh, to 
perform the previous attack against uh, this time using a WPA2 EAP. I'm going to fast forward again because we have 10 minutes. So we're going to connect the, the victim device to the, uh, to, to the legitimate access point on the top right. And then we're going to start the rogue access point attack. And that's going to happen right here. So we're, we're, we're now spawning the rogue access point on the left. And then we're going to um, lob dauth packets at this, uh, you know, at, at the legitimate access point and the client associated with the legitimate access point. And that's going to cause it to roam over to our rogue access point. As you can see, we've, we've roamed over. And, you know, it, it's, it's tried to authenticate. It's kicked us off because we, we, we failed the uh, initial, um, the, the very last phase of, of the, uh, uh, of the inner authentication, um, but you know at this point, you know we've also just cracked the we, we've performed the auto crack and add, which you can see on the left here, and and it's going to, you know at this point we just relaunch the attack, you know restart the access point, and do it again, and we'll notice that the victim associates with us. So hit connect, and at this point we're we're actually associating once again with the target access point, so we can rinse rinse and repeat. And here we go. Bear with me. It'll happen like here. Actually, I'll just I'll just skip forward a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. So where is it? Yeah. Oh. Okay. So we're getting a weird like start warning thing, but. There we go. Okay, so we, you know, at this point, the um, the victim has just uh, associated with the rogue access point. As you can see, we have hashes on the left, um, and you know, as we type stuff in the address bar, you know, we're sending out these HTTP requests, and it's just forcing more authentication attempts with the attacker. So that that's a hostile portal attack against uh, um, against uh, WPA2 EAP. So what does this get us? I mean, it get, it, it gets these similar similar results to LMNR and MVTNS poisoning. There are a few key advantages here. Uh, one, no network access required, and we're also not limited to a local subnet because you get everything that's connected to wireless. Um, it's also not a passive attack, which is pretty cool. You know, you're not waiting for an LMNR and MVTNS uh, lookup request. You're actually, you know, forcing stuff to um, to authenticate with you. So back to our scenario. You know, and, and now we're going to move on to something. Uh, uh, called an indirect wireless pivot, and this is how you use um, uh, rogue AP attacks to bypass uh, NAC mechanisms. So uh, here we are. We, we're, we're back at our, our scenario again, uh, and, and, and we have the, the attacker, uh, which is us, and, and we're on this quarantine VLAN over here. And of course, we want to get over to this restricted VLAN and access these sensitive resources. Um, unfortunately, you know, as we mentioned earlier, we've been we've been uh, jailed by the NAC, and we've, we're, we're kind of stuck over here. Well, although you know, what if what if we use a second uh, a, a second wireless interface to perform um, a rogue AP attack and then just force that authorized uh, device to, to connect to a rogue access point. You know, at that point, you know, we could just use the, the hostile portal attack, which we just talked about, uh, to, to, to get this device to send us NTLM hashes. Crack those hashes offline. And at this point, you have the capability to authenticate with the victim and, and, and place a payload on the victim. You know, you might have to come back, re repeat the first part of the attack to get it to connect to you, uh, but whatever. You know, so. At this point, you know, we, we've, we, we send this payload to the victim, you know, and what if we use like a scheduled task or something like that? For the sake of example, for, forget about being stealthy for a second, but just uh, for the sake of example, we use, we, we use a scheduled task, a time payload, and then we just allow the victim device, which is authorized, remember, to reassociate with the wireless network that it was originally associated to that we're attacking. Well, at this point, it's still authorized, so it just gets moved over to the restricted VLAN, and now we just wait for the reverse shell. And this NAC that you see in the middle, this could have been the, the, the most effective NAC in the world. It wouldn't have mattered because we were still able to remove this device uh, from, from, its, from its habitat, from, from its target network, onto a network that we completely control, and we can attack it. So a better approach, a faster approach for doing this uh, is to use an SMB relay attack, right? So you know, we talked about that earlier, but let's say we have two devices now, and you have to use two devices because unfortunately, uh, since 2008, due to uh, a service patch, uh, by Microsoft, MS08068, I believe. Um, you, you can't actually just do an SMB relay, relay attack from one device and then back to it. That's an SMB reflection. Uh, you need at least two um, devices in order to make it work. Um, but let's say we have a couple of devices on the network, right? You know, once again, you force them to associate with you. And, you know, assuming that, that you know, uh, you have an account that, that, can, that can authenticate with both, 
you perform the SMB relay attack. Uh, well, you, you do the hostile portal attack, and then that allows you, remember, you're, you're receiving um, NTLM hashes at that point, so you, you can perform an SMB relay attack. And then, you know, once again, we place a time payload on the victim, on one of the victims. You allow the devices to reassociate with the target network by, by killing your rogue AP, and then, once again, just wait for the reverse shell. And uh, let's, do, let's do this last, let's show you guys this last, uh, this attack in action, then we'll wrap this up. So now we, have, uh, now we have two victim devices on the top left and right. We have Leroy and Jenkins. And then uh, on, the, on the bottom left, we have our, our, our legitimate access point. And then on the right, we have, um, we have the attacker. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to connect um, both of these devices to the network. And we're going to start a rogue access point attack, like so, on the right. And... So our rogue access point is now live, so we're going to send dauth packets to force it to roam, the, the client device it to roam. All right, one of them is authenticated, as you can see right here. And we're going to do this again, but this time for the second client device, and there we have this second authentication. So both devices are now associated with our rogue access point attack, or our rogue access point. So now we're going to create a... Um, a stager. We're using the Empire uh, PowerShell framework, uh, if you guys are familiar with it. But it's, if, if not, it's kind of like Metasploit, but using PowerShell. It's the easiest way to describe it. But the stager, that's our payload. So we're gonna, we're, we've generated our, 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 our stager. And we're going to, at this point, um, we're going to find an IP address of, of one of our associated uh, clients. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to settle for Jenkins here. And we're going to use Jenkins' IP address. And then we're going to uh, take our stager and, and use it as the payload for SMB Relay X, which is an uh, 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 SMB Relay tool, right? And, you know, as you can see, we interacted with, with IE that, um, that, that gave us HTTP traffic, which is enough to set up the, the SMB Relay. And if we, if we go back, there's a bit of a delay on the reverse shell here. Um, we're going to receive our first, uh, our, our first reverse connection, which is going to allow us to place that time payload on the victim. There we go. If you can see that little green text, uh, it says initial agent, uh, you know, blah, 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 connected to, uh, to 10.0.0.184, now active. That's our, um, that, that's our payload. And, and, we've, and we, are now, uh, we are now actually um, executing commands on the victim machine. So now we're going to use module. We're going to use a scheduled task module to uh, place a scheduled task on this machine now that we're um, authenticated with it. Oh, and before we do that, we're going to run who am I and also just so see we have uh, our, our, our privs right now are NC authority system. And we're also going to just to check the host name and figure out which one we're connected to, we're going to use the host name command. So we're going to do shell host name. And yeah, we're connected. We're, we're currently, you know, have a shell on Jenkins. So that one, on the, we're, we're, this, we're this guy on the left right there. And yeah, we're going to create that scheduled task. And what, what's going to happen here is that we're going to set the, 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 the time for execution just a couple minutes in the future, right? So um, interesting thing happened when I was like recording this, which was that I actually forgot to, um, to attach the virtual device that was associated with the, the, the first um, wireless interface to the virtual machine, right? And I was originally going to just like re-record it, right? But then like something really interesting happened. I did set 160 retries. Uh, for for that second for that second payload the time payload, so um, what what, you're, what I ended up doing is like you know I reattached the um, what you're going to see me do is you're going to see me reattach the uh, th the first device you know that, that I forgot to attach and then you know a couple seconds later I'm still going to receive the reverse shell because this thing is still consistently trying to connect over and over again uh, to this device that wasn't there so I thought that was kind of cool so I kind of left it in there so we've executed it. At this point, we're going to actually kill our, our rogue access point attack and allow everything to reconnect. Um, and you'll notice on the left here, we have one association right there. And our second association uh, should have happened as well. At this point, you know, I'm going to skip through waiting through two minutes of this. Two minutes. Just amount, enough time we need. OK, cool. Um, so I'm going to skip through this. And you see here, you should see me reattach the network adapter because I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, time to redo everything. And then I, I start clearing everything, right? Oops. 
I, and I, I start clearing everything. And I hit the back button on this because I'm about to clear everything and start from scratch. And then I receive the initial agent. So it actually did work as soon as I re you know, plugged in the network adapter again. So that's an indirect wire wireless pivot. Um, so the equivalent technique of doing this in a wired network would be literally unplugging an authorized device um, from the wall and then connecting it to a, a hostile network on which you can actually attack it. Um, you know, the reason why we're able, we're able to do that is because port-based access controls rely on the assumption that the physical layer can be trusted. In a wireless network, um, WPA2 EAP is the means through which the integrity of the physical layer um, is, is actually assured. You know, and if you can't trust your, your EAP implementation uh, and you have a weak form of it, the attacker can freely control your physical layer and, and, and it basically, you know, renders port-based access controls irrelevant. So what this demonstrates is that port-based NAC mechanisms, they don't really effectively mitigate the risk presented by weak WPA2 implementations or EAP implementations. Um, and that, you know, adding port-based NAC mechanisms to a wireless network, it doesn't really make the use of EAP TTLS or EAP PEEP any less inappropriate if the network in question is used to grant access to sets of information. And, you know, by sense of information, we're, we're usually talking about, you know, something like PCI or HIPAA data. Remember that compliance doesn't necessarily mean security. So, um, I'm just going to make like one last case for EAP TLS. Um, you know, it's not as bad as it used to be. Uh, you can use group policy to, to push out the search to the various uh, network endpoints. And, and, and your best option, I, th I think, is to, you know, to mitigate this, this kind of attack is to use a private CA uh, within your network and then leverage Active Directory to deploy EAP TLS. You know, and, and of course, you can, if you have like a, um, you know, bring your own devices, like, like a BYOD policy and people can bring their own devices on the network. Um, at this point, you could use like a solid MDM to, to get those certs on there or just have like a really streamlined BYOD onboarding solution. And you can actually use Let's Encrypt as well to roll out EAP TLS. Uh, although even the, even the people who make Let's Encrypt are like, this is probably not the best way to do it. Um, yeah, but just some closing thoughts. You know, just because wireless and wired networks um, operate similarly on, on, at a logical level, and, and they're designed to do that, so they, it, it should be transparent when you're looking at higher levels of, of abstraction. On, on a physical level, in terms of the physics behind it, they, they work in a completely different way. And, you know, so you have to, be, you know, keep that in mind when designing security uh, mechanisms to protect them. And, of course, as a community, we should really question whether it's a sound decision to neglect EAP TLS completely uh, in favor of more reactive approaches that focus on access control rather than threat containment right, and threat containment. And, of course, uh, I think most importantly, you know, the needs for convenience and security, they're usually at odds with one another. Uh, so I, I think we should just, you know, be really honest with ourselves and maintain a very healthy skepticism uh, toward proposed solutions that promise both. And if you want to look at the tool that, that uh, I've been using to do this stuff um, throughout, the, throughout the demo, uh, or throughout the, uh, the talk, uh, you can go to github.com slash stolsys slash uh, epammer and, and check it out. It's open source. Thank you.